Uh, if you'll turn to chapter 7 of the Revelation. We had finished up chapter 6 as we've seen the six seals broken. And one of the reasons people have trouble understanding the Revelation is not realizing that John will put parentheses in his book, uh, in the letter. And so you get confused because the judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are in consecutive order, but then he'll put that little insert or parentheses to look forward or to look back. So after the sixth seal is broken, there's one more that is to be opened. And before we get to that one, there is chapter 7. That's that interlude that John is good about putting in there. Between the sixth and the seventh seal, there is an parenthesis. Uh, notice how chapter 6 ends. Uh, before I get to that, let me, let me encourage you again, folks, and I know this sounds like a broken record. If you're not looking at what's happening today in our world through the lens of Scripture, if you're not seeing the shadows that are lengthening and becoming darker, and darker and darker, and then we sit there and wonder why. It's all for fulfilled, Scripture being fulfilled. We don't just seem to be concerned about that. And that's why there's an urgency to be a witness to the Lord Jesus. There are people that so desperately need to know him. So now before that seventh seal is broken, John saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth they're holding back the four winds of God before they are unleashed in a greater display of judgment. Winds are described in the Bible as God's judgment, and they're holding it back so that they will not blow on the earth or the sea or any tree, which is amazing in itself that God's angel under his, angels under his sovereign control are doing the master's bidding. And that's sad because we don't do that. We know something that angels don't know, and that's redemption. But they're eager to obey their Savior. So you're reminded of the question the Lord Jesus asked. If I am Lord, why do you not obey me? It's easy to confess that with your mouth. But if I am Lord, why do you not do what I tell you to do? Lord. And here are these angels doing God's bidding. And then John saw another angel coming from the rising of the sun. And we saw last week that that is from the east. He had a seal. Here's why there's a parenthesis between the sixth and the seventh seal. So God can seal 144,000 Jews. Well, seal them. So that during this tribulation period, these Jews will become his evangelists. Again, you see God's mercy and grace at work. And the angel, the fifth angel, is screaming, do not harm these, the trees, the sea, until... We have sealed the bond slaves of God. So the judgment is suspended in chapter 7 until the 144,000 Jews are sealed. When the trumpets begin to sound, then we're going to see all of these that are mentioned not to harm being harmed. All of that will come to a destruction. Who is to be sealed? And he told us, and I think we went through that last week, 12,000 out of, of the 12 tribes of, Jesus, of Jews, Israel. One of the hardest things to overcome is people's ignorance about the Jews. They are God's chosen people. Not because they deserve to be chosen, but because they were more numerous. But in God's sovereign will and grace, he chose that, chose that nation in order that they might be the 
the very vessel through whom the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, would come to the world. They were to bear witness to the one true God as God brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. They would be the ones to write the Bible. They failed miserably. And when you go back in the prophets, God very clearly told them, I'm going to scatter you to the four ends of the earth because you have disobeyed me. But I will bring you back. And it's an interesting study and journey to see how God has kept his promises with the Jews. Now he is sealing 144,000 to do everything they failed to do when they were in the promised land so that they might be his evangelists. And I'm not going to go back under the, over that. Dan, I again, remind you that Dan and Ephraim are omitted and replaced by Levi and Joseph, the father of Ephraim, and most likely because of idolatry. And then when you come to verses 9 through 17, God seals these 144,000. They are protected. They are safe and secure in order to carry out what we call the Great Commission, to bear witness to a living Christ. As one writer put it, and the fact that he's sealing these Jews, this critical passage reinforces the biblical truth that God is not through with the nation of Israel. Read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Sometimes those chapters are taken out of context and applied to something that Paul is not referring to. They will. They failed in their mission. They did not be, become the witness, but that will not be the case in the future. God is not finished with them yet. So now in verses 9 through 17, here is the result of the witness that they're bearing. Let me just read that. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Here's the result of the witness of these 140,000, 44,000 Jews. They're going to become the greatest, greatest missionary force the world has ever, ever known. Wow. Our grandchildren have been blessed to travel all over the world. About three years ago, our oldest granddaughter, Tracy's, went to Israel on a mission trip. I, ha I had her send me that picture a while ago because I, I don't know how to operate all of my stuff, and I had lost it somewhere. But there's a picture of her at Ashdod, down in the southern part of Israel, on her knees praying over not just Ashdod, but the nation of Israel. Now the greatest missionary force the world's ever seen is unleashed as these 144,000 began to share the gospel. And as a result of that, behold, a great multitude that cannot be numbered. He doesn't give us an exact number, but it is large, indicated by the word behold. They, had come, they have come from every nation, all the tribes, and the peoples and the tongues. People from every race, every culture, every language. What an ingathering that's going to be during the tribulation. What a marvelous picture of God's mercy and grace. And that's why you and I need to be about the business of sharing Christ before that door is shut. 
grace in the midst of wrath. They're witnessing to their Messiah and to the Savior of all who will trust him. They will become the light to a darkened world, a blessing to all nations. And this is why I say you don't, the Bible is not truncated. We truncate it. We just chip it up into little sections. We don't see it as a whole. So you go back to the covenant that God made with Abraham. And part of that covenant was you will become a blessing to the whole world. And now this part of that covenant is being fulfilled out of every tribe and every race and every nation and every culture. There's an ingathering of people. Wow. God will fulfill all of the covenants that he made with Israel, and he will do that in the tribulation and millennium. Now, we don't see that sometimes, but this is Old Testament prophecy. That's why you have to look at the Bible as a whole. In Isaiah 49, 6, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Here's the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in the tribulation. In Isaiah 52:10, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all of the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. In Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32, Peter quoted this passage on the day of Pentecost. And sometimes there will be charismatic groups that will take this and say, this is for now, but when I understand the context, this will be fulfilled in the tribulation period. This great crowd of people, that's overwhelming. Standing before the throne of God and the Lamb. And not only are they standing there, John said they are clothed with a white robe, and that is a picture of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus and the celebration of the fact that they have found the Savior and the Messiah. They're holding palm branches in their hands, and this refers back to the Feast of Tabernacles. In, Luke, in Leviticus chapter 23, Israel celebrated the miraculous provision of Yahweh in the wilderness. He took care of them. And they used the palm branches as a time of celebration. Is that not what they laid before Jesus when he drove in? How do you put all that? We just don't, we don't put that together, folks. All of this is fulfillment. Why do we use palm branches? When Jesus rode into the city on the donkey, that's exactly what the crowd was doing. They're waving the palm branches. And they're shouting, Hosanna! And that word Hosanna means save, O Lord. Save us! They didn't recognize their Messiah. Many of them did not. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And now with all of this great multitude saved, standing there with palm branches in their hands, what a fitting, fitting celebration symbol of the unqualified provision of salvation from the world. Wow, what a great God we have. And that is so easy for us to say and never realize the impact of that. What a great God we say, have. And then in verse 10, John tells us these redeemed tribulation saints. And remember, this is in the tribulation period. Wow, a great multitude. And we've already seen some that were under the altar and they're crying out, how long, O Lord? And now there are others that have come out of the tribulation. They are crying out to the, south, to the one who sits on the throne in his lamb. And again, we're looking into the very heart of true praise and worship. True praise and worship they recognize the origin and the source of their salvation God the Father through the Son 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These martyred saints are not the only one worshiping, as John tells us in verses 11 and 12. The angels, the 24 elders, the four living creatures fall on their faces. They're prostrate in worship. Isn't it amazing? Those that are in heaven are recognizing and acknowledging who God is and what he has done, and they're crying out, Amen. Amen. Your word is true. It is trustworthy. It is faithful. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to our great God forever under the ages of the ages. And that's just a stronger word for eternity in the Greek. Wow. This is not just praise for the moment. This is praise that's going to echo throughout all of eternity. And some of us are bored silly when we come to church today. Well, can't wait to get out and go do something more exciting. Wow, we're going to be doing this through all eternity, folks. Praising him. Worship will be a part of our life forever and forever. And how little preparation we make down here. We're so busy magnifying ourselves and not God. We're seeking our own pleasure and our own priorities and our own agendas. We want our feelings and emotions satisfied. Not up there. And I was sharing, I guess, Wednesday night. Again, my, I've had people ask me about that book Eric sent me, Get Over Yourself. He's not talking about me. He's talking about every true believer who never understands what Jesus said. Deny yourself and take up. You can't deny yourself till you get over yourself. That's the theme of the book. When I recognize what God has done for me, that it's all of him, all of grace in his mercy. And so we have churches today that are so self-centered. They concentrate on this and they concentrate on that. They're trying to satisfy people. What? Then in verses 13 through 17, John has witnessed this scene of praise and true worship. And now one of the 24 elders ask him, listen to what is being said. This is interesting when you look at it. Then one of the elders who answered, saying to me, Those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out, who have come out of the, now watch the wording, the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear away from their eyes. Now, we usually use this at funerals, and this is true. But in context here, these are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. And the Great Tribulation is telling us tonight that's the midpoint of the, three and a, of, of the seven year period, the three and a half years in, and from then on out, the next three and, and a half years will be unprecedented horror. And these are the ones that are coming out of the Great Tribulation. I've recommended before to you to watch that movie Schindler's List, and it is it is rated R, and there are some things in it that. But if you watch that, that is a almost accurate portrayal of what happened to the Jews in the in the Holocaust. Wow, John, who are these people? Where did they come from? 
Now, if I were to give you a pop test, who do the 24 elders represent? Oh. <laughs> the church, the church, the raptured church in heaven. Wow. And now, one of the elders is asking John, who are these people? Where do they come from? John simply can only answer this way. Let me read that. I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh. These people have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. elder is not asking for information he knows he's just wanting to clarify this for john and for you and me tonight who will would read the revelation to understand this again as one commentator put it this exemplifies the dialogue format used from time to time to convey an explanation of a vision this text this tool shows that visions were not given for the purpose of specular displays, but to convey revelation, the details of which were not to be missed. And John just said the only thing, <laughs> some of us need to know how to shut our mouths. He didn't go into some big thesis and dissertation. The only thing he could say, you know, I don't. And that ought to be sometimes what we say. You know, I don't don't john didn't know and he's asking for clarification and the answer comes back to him these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation the last three and a half years and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb and the, the identity of all of these are clear they're coming out of the great tribulation these are martyred saints they have died for their faith, their witness to the Lord Jesus. The 144,000 have done their job. They have borne witness. And this a great multitude saved during the tribulation. Dr. John Walbert puts it like this. The question has often been asked, is it, will anybody be saved after the rapture? No. The scriptures clearly indicate that a great multitude of Jews and Gentiles will trust in the Lord after the church is caught up to glory. I don't let that mislead you folks. Paul is very clear in 2 Thessalonians. If you sat down in a church year after year after year after year and you've heard the gospel and heard the gospel and you've rejected it and you've refu refused to trust Jesus, you probably will not be saved in the tribulation because you're so gospel hardened. But these are those who've not had the opportunity to hear the gospel once. Once. When we've had the opportunity to hear it every day. These have come out of the great tribulation. And there is a definite article in front of these words. The, a definite article. They've come out of this time of a holocaust. Jesus talked about that, and I put that on the board last week in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. It's a specific time frame, folks. The last three and a half years of the tribulation. And I, I sat there with my mouth open this morning when Ron Alexander sent me that picture that has just been erected, that statue that's just been erected in front of the UN. Wow. I, I can't I don't have the capacity to show you that picture. It, it's right out of Daniel and the Revelation, the beast that has been erected in front of the UN. Now, it's there. 
And that's why I'm telling you, folks, the shadows are getting darker and longer. It could be tonight that our Lord would call us up to meet him in, meet him in the air. That's, and you read that throughout the Revelation and Daniel, 42 months, 1260 days. This is the last type of the tribulation period. And Jesus calls this the time of the great tribulation. And these have been saved and they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. What a tremendous truth that is. And there are some churches today that don't want you to talk about the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Their garments are made white because they've washed them in the blood. Now go back to your, if you are a believer, to the days that before you were saved. All of our garments are filthy rags in the sight of God. How do I make them white? Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. This is why the blood sacrifice was necessary in the Old Testament. The blood of those animals could never, ever take away the sin. The only thing that blood did in the Old Testament was hold back the judgment of God until the true Lamb of God came and the one John identified as the Lamb who not covers it, just covers it, takes it away. Takes it away. Now, understand that, folks. The substitutionary, redemptive death on the cross covers these tribulation saints. It's what he has done for them. And they have turned to their Messiah, to their Savior. They have repented, and now they are justified and reconciled to God. Being washed in the blood of the Lamb. And these tribulation saints John is picturing for us are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night. Oh, that that were true of all of us here today. Keep asking me, are, are you retired? Or when are you, you don't retire in God's service, folks. You don't. You do not. You do not retire. They are serving him day and night. And the word serve here is a present tense verb. It means to minister. And the New Testament Greek word means to, to, to minister with worship. This was a word that was used to describe the ministry of the priest in the Old Testament. Continuous service. And I'll tell you why that's so, because there's no day and night. We're going to be doing this forever. Wow. And we have difficulty down here. Doing it now. Doing it now. Day and night we're going to serve him. Dr. John Walbert puts it like this. This expression is highly significant for it indicates that heaven is not only a place of rest from earthly toil, but a place of privileged service. We're going to be serving him up there. And what we're doing up, we'll be doing up there will be determined by the quality of our works down here. And then John says, God will spread his tabernacle over them. In John 1, 14, the word became flesh and what? Tabernacled among us. It was in the tabernacle in the temple that the presence of God dwelt. And now God is going to spread his tabernacle over those saints. This is nothing other than the presence of almighty God. They've been through unspeakable, undescribable terror and horror and death. They have been killed by the Antichrist because of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their steadfast loyalty to him. But when they enter God's presence, they are now in a heavenly sanctuary. 
the most secure place you could ever want to be. And there they will be sheltered from the terrors of the Antichrist and the fallen world. Wow. Sheltered while God continues to pour out his wrath on this. We don't believe that sometimes. If we did, we wouldn't rest until we told people about the Lord Jesus. It's interesting, again, you have to go back to the Old Testament examples and the, and the prophecies and the teachings. In that shelter, God will provide what they had been deprived of during the tribulation. Understand that. And it's easy to read these passages and do it at a funeral. But keep it all in context. They had known hunger and thirst because why? They couldn't buy food if they didn't have the mark of the beast. And we're seeing that develop here in this own country. If you're not vaccinated, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I'm not knocking vaccination. What I am telling you folks, they're taking freedoms away from us. Wow. They couldn't buy in the tribulation if they didn't have the mark of the beast. And that's why God is telling John, look at everything God is doing for them now. They have known hunger and thirst. The sun had been burning and scorching, and as a result of all that occurs, and we've seen that in the realm of nature, painful burning heat falling on people. And the reason for all these provisions? Because the lamb is in the midst of God's throne. He is their shepherd. Wow. Quote Psalm, you can quote Psalm 23, I hope you could, and never see the connection. God was Israel's shepherd. That's why David is saying, Yahweh is my shepherd. He is right now today, and he will be forever. I will shepherd my people. I will be in their midst, and I will guide them. And then he will wipe away every single tear. And the little preposition that he uses there, it shows the completeness of this. In Isaiah 25, 8, he talks about that. You imagine the tears that would be shed during the tribulation? I've shed tears, and I still do. But going through that, God will wipe them all away. What a hope to look forward to for those that are going to be in the tribulation. This is why John is writing. And here the tears in context is referring to these tribulation saints. But you turn over to Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, he's going to do the same for all of us in the new Jerusalem, at the new heaven and the new earth. Wow, wow what a great God we have. I was reading that in my quiet time today. God takes our tears and puts them in a bottle. He's got your tears in a bottle. Though. He knows every tear that you've ever shed. That's the sovereign, almighty majesty of our God. And we just take that for granted. And that brings us to chapter 8. And when we come to the 8th chapter, the parentheses is finished. And now John moves to the breaking of the last final seal, the seventh seal. He's returning to everything that he has recorded in chapter 6. And now this seventh seal will be broken. And when the seventh seal is broken, the time of the great tribulation is about to begin. And from here on out, we will see the judgments of God intensifying, being magnified, increasing in intensity, so chapter 8 begins with the little word, when. And in the Greek, this is an adverb that's used for a definite occurrence. When. When what? When he broke the seventh seal. This is a definite time. And 
notice what happens when he breaks that seventh seal. There is silence in heaven for one half an hour. Wow. Silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And that's very significant, folks. When the first six seals were broken, God's judgment was, po were, was poured out immediately. But now when the seventh seal is broken, the result of that is amazing. There is a, paraphrase, there's a holy hush in heaven. No praise coming from the redeemed. No praise coming from the angels. Just silence. This little word silence in the Greek. I'm sure if you've been a teacher, a lawyer, a book. Shh. That's how you pronounce it. Shh. <laughs> Let me make this clear, folks. And sometimes we'll sing, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be what? Silent and never understand that. Silence in the Bible has always represented judgment. Judgment. Sometimes in a Baptist church, you want to just stand up over with a, micro a magnaphone and say, shh. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel 2, 9, Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving for the birth of Samuel. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. A man will not prevail by his strength. In Habakkuk 2.20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In Zechariah 2.13, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he has been aroused from his holy habitation. Judgment is about to intensify. What a vivid picture, a half hour of silence. That's the calm before the storm. I was driving to Mississippi uh, several years ago to do a youth retreat and had a friend with me uh, out of Will Point. We were traveling together, and we got between Jackson and Hattiesburg, down 49, and all of a sudden there was just this eerie, eerie silence. And neither one of us knew what was going on. We were passing through a tornado. Just silence it. That's before the storm hits, the calm. Now, one of the commentators that's uh, sort of liberal, but sort of like eating fish. You just eat the meat and spit the bones out. He's a master, a master at word studies, Dr. William Barclay. He calls it an intensely dramatic silence, a sh sheer stillness more effective than the crash of thunder and lightning. Psalm 78, uh, 76, verses 8 and 9, You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Now, 30 minutes doesn't seem like an ordinary long time, does it? But when it's a time of absolute silence, absolute silence, it seems like an eternity, doesn't it? Um, something tremendous is about to take place. Or you might, as Dr. Walwood points out, it, it might be the silence before the foreman of a jury gives the verdict gives the verdict. The door is about to be shut, folks. About to be shut. And 
John tells us in verse 2, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. When the seal is broken, John said, I saw seven angels. And there's a definite article before the word seven angels. The specific seven angels indicating that this is a special group a group of angels that some have called the angels of his presence. They stand before God, and they're ready to do his will and obey his command. And we do know from other scriptures that the God created angels with, with rank and order. Uh, and these seven angels are given seven trumpets, which will bring the beginning of the last three and a half years of this tribulation period. I don't have time. You can go back and look at this. You see, are trumpets important in the Bible? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Didn't you tell me? Oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm about to do something I should have done. If you've ever been in Israel and you've heard the shofar sound, trumpets are central to the Bible. This is how God dealt with the nation of Israel. This is how he's going to deal at the rapture. The trump of God will sound. Ah. And the trumpets were associated with a lot of different events. God would use the trumpets to call and assemble the nation of Israel. In fact, in Numbers chapter 10, God gives clear instruction about the use of the trumpet. It was to be sounded at the time of war. It was to be sounded at the religious feast. It is to be sounded at worship. It was the trumpet and the shouts that brought down the wall of Jericho. And when Christ comes for us, folks, the trumpet will sound. And we're out of here, and now seven trumpets are about to sound, and they're going to unleash an even more terrifying, terrifying experience of God's wrath and judgment greater than the sixth seal. And I've run out of time. I'll have to take up here. John sees one more thing. I saw another angel come and stand at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which is before the throne. One more thing John is describing for us. Another angel that are, he is distinct from these seven. Alos, the Greek, another means another the same kind. This angel stands before the altar in front of God. And this is more than likely the altar of incense. The altar that was made of gold and the high priest would burn the incense. And he held in his hand a golden censer or fire pan. And much incense was given to him that he might fill that, that, in, that censer. That, and these are the prayers of the saints about to be poured out. Oh. There is a temple in heaven. When we don't know the Old Testament, when we don't know uh, Israel, when we're, we're not familiar, that's why I urge you all the time, folks, if you can find completed Jews that write scholars, that write commentaries, you can see something you didn't see before. And it makes it all clearer. Clearer. Right? This is a clear picture of the altar of incense before the throne of God. And the priest would take the hot coals from the brass altar in the morning and in the evening and bring them to the holy place, to the altar of incense, where the incense was being burned. And as he threw those on there, it would fill the holy place with smoke. All of this rising up to God, a symbol of intercessory prayer and worship. And here he's taking the prayers of these martyred saints. This judgment's about to be unleashed. I'll stop here. Uh -uh.
again, these are vivid pictures John is painting. And it's a source of encouragement to those that will be left behind and those who will come to faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, and I would challenge and encourage all of us to examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith. And if we're not in the faith, to recognize and realize that the Lamb of God died in order that you and I might be washed and cleansed in His blood, that we might be clothed in the robes of righteousness. Do this every service, whether you're watching online or in the auditorium. Holy Spirit has used the Word tonight to convict you and show you where you are in your relationship to God. I invite you to pray this prayer. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me. I invite him into my life. I accept him. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you online or if you're in the auditorium and we come forward, you can do that as David leads us here. If he's dealing with you about being that witness where you are today before the church is taken out, yield to what he's saying to you as David leads us in this hymn. Father, thank you for your word. We ask your Holy Spirit to bear fruit in our lives because we've heard you. In the precious, strong name of Christ, we pray. Amen.